professional football, that most fascinating, most exciting of all spectator sports, came to Mid-America in 1963 when the Dallas Texans became the Kansas City Chiefs. The men behind this history-making move were Lamar Hunt, owner of the Texans, and Jack Stedman, his general manager. It was Hunt who in 1960 founded the American Football League, bringing the thrills and color of professional football to areas most of which had never seen the spectacular game. Hunt's team, the Texans, became an artistic success. They won the American Football League championship in 1962. But the crowds necessary to support a sport which is expensive as well as exciting never came. It was for this reason that Hunt listened when Kansas City's civic leaders, men like former Mayor H. Rowe Bartle, banker Ray Evans, and Chamber of Commerce executive Bill Dower suggested that he move his team to Mid-America. No owner, no team, nothing was ever courted with more zest and enthusiasm than were Hunt and the Texans. Kansas City and the entire area made it readily apparent that they wanted the Texans and were prepared to do more than talk about it. A Chamber of Commerce committee headed by Evans, a one-time All-America football player himself, organized and conducted a whirlwind season ticket campaign. With the aid of hundreds of volunteer workers, the drive was an overwhelming success. And Mid-America had its professional football team, the Kansas City Chiefs. Mid-America's new team was an exciting outfit, often an explosive outfit. Let me take you back a few weeks to a visit with Chiefs coach Hank Stram to show you some of the things Kansas City area people were cheering about. Hi, Coach. Hi, Merle. How are you? Fine, thank you. What's going on? I'm looking over some grades. Grades? What kind of grades? Sit down a minute and I'll show you what we mean. Okay. What kind of grades do you have in pro football? Uh, Merle, actually, you know, football is a game of timing and execution. And uh, so we take films and grade each particular player on every play that he participates in in a game. Mm -hmm. That way it gives us a, a further knowledge of the execution and timing, and uh, if there are any corrections to be made, why we can make those corrections because of what we see in the film. Very good. As long as we're sitting here, why don't uh, you join me in watching a little bit of this execution and timing. I'd love this to. Film. Very good. take long to see what Hank meant by timing and execution, and it won't take long to see what I mean by excitement. The quarterback in the plays we've just seen is Len Dawson, number 16 for the Chiefs, and one of pro football's great quarterbacks. Dawson was American Football League Player of the Year in 1962 when he led the then Texans to their championship. In 1963, he again led the AFL with 26 touchdown passes and completed a remarkable 54% of his throws. Possibly the coolest of all American League quarterbacks, Dawson is almost as dangerous when he is forced to run as when he throws. His longest run of 1963 was this 43-yard touchdown against the Eastern Division champion, Boston Patriots. Len Dawson's longest pass play of the year was an 82-yard strike to Frank Jackson against the New York Jets. Jackson, number 26, used as a flanker for the first time in 1963 was an almost instant success. He caught 50 passes for 785 yards and eight touchdowns. In 
addition to his 82-yard catch and run against New York, he had an 81-yard TD against Denver, the two longest scrimmage plays of the Chiefs season. Jackson was used as a ball carrier only three times, and on this reverse, went for a touchdown against Denver. Len Dawson's number one receiver was once again the super dependable Chris Burford, number 88. Burford, who makes the pressure catch look routine, grabbed a career-high 68 passes for 824 yards and nine touchdowns. In 1962, it was Burford to whom Dawson looked in crucial situations. A notable example was a desperation drive against the Buffalo Bills, which resulted in a 27-27 tie with the Eastern Power. Football League's number one tight end in 1963 was Kansas City's Fred Arbanis. Arbanis, number 84, was not only a superb blocker, but an outstanding receiver. His 34 receptions were more than any tight end in the league, and six of those catches went for touchdowns. An all-league selection at the conclusion of the season, the 6'3", 241-pound Arbanis appears destined for a long tenure as one of the AFL's outstanding stars. Tommy Brooker, the field goal kicking star of 1962, and Dick Johnson provided top-notch support for the three leading receivers, as did backs like Curtis McClinton and Abner Haynes, although their primary duties called for more running than catching. Clinton, the Kansas strong boy and number 32 for the Chiefs, was Kansas City's most effective running back most of the season. He averaged four yards a try on 142 carries and caught 27 passes. McClinton runner pass reception resulted in a touchdown. And the count even threw for one touchdown. A 33-yard strike to Chris Burford against the Denver Broncos. Abner Haynes, number 28, and the most heralded of all Chiefs stars, scored six touchdowns, caught 33 passes, and averaged nearly four yards on 99 carries. longest run of the season was a 46-yard trip against the New York Jets.
He went 73 yards against the San Diego Chargers with a Dawson pass on his longest play of the season. The veteran Jack Spikes, the hero of the championship victory in 1962, was again one of the AFL's most dependable backs. A good blocker as well as a runner and receiver, Spike's contribution was a great, if sometimes underrated one. These were the workhorses among the Chiefs running backs, but some of the most outstanding work came from others like ex-Kansas Jayhawk, Burt Cohn, number 22, who went 51 yards against Houston on the Chiefs' longest running play of the year. And Gerald Wilson, number 44, who besides being one of the AFL's best punters, gave evidence that he could catch and run with the football too. Len Dawson's understudy was again Eddie Wilson, and the second year quarterback from Arizona really earned his spurs in 1963. Eddie, number 12, completed 20 of 32 passes for 258 yards and two touchdowns in a starting assignment against the Patriots. The Eastern champions and the Chiefs tied 24-24 in the thrilling contest in Boston. That's the chief story as far as the offense is concerned, except for the group which is perhaps the most important of all, the offensive line. Two-time all-league tackle Jim Tyre, a 6'6", 291-pounder. Rookie tackle Dave Hill and guards Ed Buddy and Denny Biodrowski. Guards Al Reynolds and Marvin Terrell and utility man Kurt Murs and the center John Gillum. When the Chiefs' offense was good, these men were as responsible as the Dawsons and the Burfords. <laughs> Defensively, the 1963 Chiefs were among the best anywhere. Hank Stram's front line had size and depth. Veterans Jerry Mays, number 75, and Mel Branch, number 87, were the anchor men, and three rookies, 6'7", 286-pound Buck Buchanan, 270-pound Kurt Farrier and the multi-talented Bobby Bell provided the support. Kansas City linebacking featuring all-league E.J. Holub was tremendous. Holub, number 55, was voted the most popular chief by the fans in mid-America. E.J. and teammates Cheryl Hedrick, number 69, Walt Corey, number 56, and Smokey Stover, number 35, were perhaps the best linebacking corps in the league. The Chiefs secondary, Johnny Robinson, Bobby Hunt, Dwayne Wood, and all AFL Dave Grayson and alternate Bobby Ply worked as a unit for the second straight year and was one of the AFL's stingiest. The only newcomer was promising Charlie Warner. The anti-pass platoon had 26 interceptions. 
Bobby Hunt was the leader with six, and Holub and Grayson had five each. Hunt, number 20, specialized in the long return. He got back 66 yards to the Denver one on this return. Four chief defensive players actually did score in 1963. Cheryl Hedrick, number 69, returned an interception 38 yards for a touchdown. Dave Grayson went 99 yards with a Denver kickoff. Grayson blocked a Denver kick, and Dwayne Wood picked up the ball and completed a 45-yard scoring play. And Jerry Mays, number 75, grabbed a New York Jet fumble and sprinted 58 yards in the season's finale. <laughs> Professional football in mid-America was all its boosters said it would be. It was exciting, often spectacular, never dull, and the future for the Kansas City Chiefs, unlimited. But wait, let's go back to Coach Stram's office and let him tell you. For the great run of Jerry Mays in our last game against the New York Jets, it's always a thrill, and it's really and truly a, a wonderful game. How about the future, Hank? How do the Kansas City Chiefs look to you in 1964? Merrill, actually, you know, I can't help but feel optimistic and enthusiastic about our 1964 squad. As you know, we have an outstanding core of uh, veterans returning, plus the fact that we have done an excellent job of signing young people for the coming season. Namely, Pete Bethard, the, the outstanding quarterback from Southern California, two outstanding tackles from Pittsburgh by the name of Ernie Borghetti and John Machuzak. Then there's halfback Joe Auer from Georgia Tech and another fine halfback preacher pilot from New Mexico State and a real fine defensive end by the name of Ed Lothamer from Michigan State. That's right, and uh, that gives you a pretty good idea of the kind of balance we will have between our veterans and rookies. Uh, I'm sure without a doubt that the people of Kansas City will really enjoy watching this team play and while I'm talking about Kansas City, Merle, I'd like to inject this little bit about the fact that we are deeply appreciative of the way the Kansas City people turned out for our games last year. Uh, it was just very heartwarming and uh, we're going to do everything we possibly can in 1964 to justify the confidence and loyalty that they showed our club last year. Kansas City is a great area, and uh, they deserve a great football team, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to be that kind of a football team.